This lesson deals with the solution to the final exam. You can find this final exam solution near the end of the ECE 201 ebook. The final has seven problems, each worth 28 or 29 points, giving a total of 200. This was the actual final exam I gave when I taught the course recently, and based on the average and standard deviation, this is the curve for the final. 160 to 200 points is the A range, 130 to 159 B, 100 to 129 C, 70 to 99 a D, and less than or equal to 69 and F. In problem number one, we're given a circuit and asked to find the Thevenin equivalent between terminals A and B, but also to find the Thevenin voltage using superposition. So let's start with that. We'll find V Thevenin due to the first source, and let's just say that's our 12 volt source. And we'll set all the other sources equal to zero, and that's just gonna be the three milliamps, so we'll make that an open circuit. Now with no current going in or out, the voltage across this resistor is zero times 5.6K. Likewise, the voltage across here is zero times 6.8K. So the voltage across terminals A and B are also the voltage across the 4.7K resistor. The current in these two resistors are the same, so therefore I could use the voltage divider. Now with this polarity, I would need to have a polarity here, in this case minus 12 volts, to get this result. Voltage divider then would be minus 12 times 4.7K over that plus 3.3K, and that turns out to be minus 7.05 volts. That was worth nine points, no partial credit. Set this voltage source equal to zero, now we'll have the 3.3K in parallel with the 4.7K. Put the current source back in, and again, with no current coming in or out, I have no drop across these resistors. So the voltage V Thevenin due to the second source is the voltage across this parallel combination. Now with this polarity of V Thevenin double prime, I need to find the current going in this direction. That's gonna be equal to a minus three milliamps times the parallel combination, and I found that to be 1.939K. So the voltage then is the product of those two, so minus 5.816. This two is worth nine points, no partial credit. Then we have to add up the results for superposition. So adding these two, we get a minus 12.866, and that was just worth one point. This was independent of what you solved in the two previous calculations. We need to find the Thevenin resistance. So we'll set all the independent sources equal to zero. So we had a short circuit here for the voltage source, and we had an open here for the current source. Found these two in parallel is 1.939K. And now that's in series with these two resistors, 5.6K and 6.8K. So adding all those together, I get 14.339K, and that was worth nine points, no partial credit. Lastly, we can express our answer here with the Thevenin voltage and the Thevenin resistance. In problem number two, we're given a circuit. I want to solve for I out when V sub S is five volts. We're going to use the property of proportionality to do this by letting I out equal one amp and figuring out the value of V sub S that would produce that. And then the ratio of I out to V sub S is our proportionality constant. And we can use that then to solve for the condition when V sub S is changed to five volts. Let's make I out equal to one amp flowing through six ohms that have six volts across these two points. With six volts here and a total of six ohms, I would have one amp going in this direction. If I have one amp here and one amp here, then I have two amps here. Two amps going through three ohms is six volts. So the voltage at this node then would be six volts plus six volts or 12 volts. With 12 volts here and six ohms, I would have two amps flowing. Two amps here and two amps here, I have four amps here. So the drop across here would be 16 volts. So the voltage here would be 16 volts plus 12. So 28 volts produces one amp out, so our proportionality constant then is one over 28. So I out is the proportionality constant times whatever V sub S is. If it's equal to 28 volts, we get one amp. If it's equal to five volts, we get 178.6 milliamps. Give 14 points in the calculations that are here, and you can break those into individual pieces. And once you make a mistake, no more partial credit after that. Whatever you solve for here, Using this to calculate this, I would give you 14 points if you did that correctly. This is problem number two. Problem number three, you're given a circuit containing resistors, an independent voltage source, and a current controlled voltage source. It has to find the mesh equations for this circuit using our inspection algorithm to set up the solutions for I1, I2, and I3, but not to solve for them. We'll start with a blank three by three matrix this column associated with I1, column two with I2, column three with I3. So we're gonna go around mesh number one, add up all the resistors and put that in row one, column one. 
What's between meshes one and two will go in row one, column two, but negated. So minus 56K, nothing between one and three, so a zero. Go around the mesh counterclockwise, you see a minus 8,000 times I of X. Round mesh two and add up the resistors. That's gonna go in row two, column two. What's between meshes two and three is a 47K, and that's gonna go in row two, column three, but negated. And what's between meshes two and one is a 56K, and that's gonna go in row two, column one, negated. No sources here, so zero. Around the third mesh, I have a 47K and a 33K. I'm gonna add those up in row three, column three. What's between meshes three and two is a 47K, so we're gonna negate that and put that in row three, column two, and nothing between three and one. Go around the mesh counterclockwise, I see a drop of minus 30 volts. This is worth 14 points. I did take two points off for each error entry and stopping at zero, if there were that many errors. I've got three unknowns here, I1, I2, and I3, and I've picked up another unknown, I sub X, but I sub X is related to I2 and I3. In fact, any voltage or any current can be expressed in terms of the mesh currents. I sub X then would be equal to I2 minus I3. It agrees with the direction of I2, it disagrees with I3. Now we're gonna multiply that by 8,000 and bring it on the other side of the equation. So let's multiply this by 8,000. So 8K times I of X would equal 8,000 I2 minus 8,000 I3. So we come from this side of the equation to this side, we're gonna have 8,000 times I2. So we're gonna add that entry here so what we had before was minus 56K times I2, and now we've got that plus 8K times I2. And we also have then a minus 8K times I3, so we're gonna put that in row one, column three, and that's gonna multiply I3. Okay, I took two points off for every wrong entry here, but based on whatever that was there before. So just taking what's here and then doing this step, and then again, just taking two points off for each entry that's wrong. You can add up all those terms and you get the final matrix describing the relationships for I1, I2, and I3. And this is problem number three. In problem number four, we're given an op-amp circuit with a 250 millivolt input. Can you find the voltage V sub X and V out? Well, we have a model for the inverting amplifier, so let's put that in. We have an input resistance of 6.8K and then a gain of a minus 91K divided by 6.8K. The voltage V sub X then is a voltage divider with the 6.8K in parallel with the 5.6K, and that's equal to 3.071K. Voltage divided with 3.3K times the input voltage of 250 millivolts. And I get 120.5 millivolts. This is worth 10 points, no partial credit. And lastly, V out is minus the ratio of the resistors, 91K divided by 6.8K, then multiplying this answer here of 120 millivolts, I got 1.613 volts, but again, a negative sign. 10 points with partial credit, multiplying whatever you found here times this ratio with the minus sign. And this is problem number four. Problem number five is a one inductor circuit with a single pole, single throw switch that opens at T equals zero. We're asked to solve for the current I sub L of T for all time. We'll use our six step algorithm from our chapter seven notes. First step is to formulate the equations. So we have a first order differential equation, so it'll be some a plus b times e to the minus t over tau. Step two is to find the pre-switching conditions of our variable, in this case I sub L. So the switch has been in this position for a long time. It's gonna open at t equals zero, but let's assume we reach steady state, and that means the inductor is a short circuit. That's gonna force all of the 12 volts across here. So the current in this resistor then would be 12 volts divided by 3.3K but there's no current going into this resistor because they have no voltage across it. So all that current goes into here. So that's 3.636 milliamps. This is worth six points, no partial credit. Step three, when our switch opens, no current is now flowing in the switch, but the current in the coil can't change instantaneously. The value of this current was 3.636 milliamps before the switch opened and must still be the same afterwards, just for a short instant in time. That's gonna be equal to A plus B times E to the zero. I have one equation and two unknowns. My step four will give you my second equation, those two unknowns. So again, let's wait for T approaching infinity. And our inductor will again be a short circuit. But with an open circuit here, there's no current. With a short circuit here, there's no voltage and therefore there's no current here. The current has to flow in this direction. So this current is equal to the negative of I sub L of infinity, but that's equal to zero. And that's A plus B times E to the minus infinity over tau, or just A. So now I've got A and I know what A plus B is, so I can solve for B. Do that just shortly. Step five is to find the Thevenin resistance seen by the inductance. So the switch is open. 
set all the independent sources equal to zero, this has no effect because it's disconnected. And looking back, all I see is the 2.2K resistor. So L was 10 millihenries, 2.2K gives me a time constant of 4.545 microseconds. This is worth six points, no partial credit. And I forgot to mention that in the last problem, this was worth six points with no partial credit. And put it all together. We have A plus B times E to the minus T over tau. Put A was zero, so we just have A plus B equal to B. That was 3.636 milliamps, E to the minus T over tau. This is true for T greater than or equal to zero. When T is equal to zero, we have 3.636 milliamps. That's the value we found in our second step of the algorithm. There's five points for putting the final equation together. And this is the complete response of problem number five. Problem number six is an RLC circuit with a single pole, single throw switch closed at T equals zero, given two initial conditions, the current flowing in the circuit and the voltage across the capacitor. Now using the formula sheet, we could calculate the value of alpha and omega naught. Here I've got a resistance of 100 ohms and an inductor of 150 millihenries. That gives me 333 radians per second. The value of omega naught is one over square to LC. L is 150 millihenries and C is 0.2 microfarads. That gives me 5.77 kiloradians per second. Now since alpha is smaller than omega naught, we have an under damped system. So using our formula sheet again, we could calculate the value of omega d, which is omega naught squared minus alpha squared, and that turns out to be 5.76 kiloradians per second. Now besides by using my initial condition, I'm also going to use the initial condition of the derivative of the current i. And we showed in class was equal to v sub l over l at the value of t equals t0 plus. And then just going around the loop up here, let's do it real quickly. When this switch is closed, I'm going to drop across here, drop across here. So the voltage across the inductor is equal to minus the voltage across the resistor minus the voltage across the capacitor. I'm going to calculate that initial condition. The voltage across the inductor can change instantaneously, but it's constrained to be related to the value of the voltage across the resistor and the capacitor, which can't jump instantaneously because the current is flowing through the resistor, which is also the inductor current. And so this was initial condition of zero, this was initial condition of 12, and so then I've got just minus 12 times one over 150 milli, and that's minus 80 amps per second. This is worth six points, no partial credit. From the formula sheet, we have a formula for I of t. It's equal to C1 times e to the minus alpha t cosine of omega dt plus theta. Now with t equals zero, we just have the cosine of theta. With t equal to zero, we have minus e to the alpha t, which would then just be e to the zero or one. So we just have C1 cosine of theta. We do have a zero initial condition given with our problem, and the value of the cosine then must be 90 degrees. This is worth six points, no partial credit. So I found that the derivative of the current at t equals zero plus with respect to t was equal to minus 80 from the last page. And then from our formula sheet, that has to equal minus alpha C1 cosine of theta minus C1 omega d times the sine of theta. The cosine of 90 is zero, so this term drops out. And the sine of 90 is equal to one, so I just have minus C1 omega d times one. And that's the equal, this minus 80 here, so we can solve for C1 then. So C1 is gonna be equal to minus omega d divided into minus 80, so those minus signs cancel, and omega d was 5.76k, and I get 13.89 milli. And that was worth six points, no partial credit. I can put it all together. So we've got C1 e to the minus alpha t cosine omega d t plus theta. And that's equal to 13.89 milli e to the minus 333 t times the cosine of 5.76 k t plus 90. As I mentioned the course, I'd rather write this term here as minus t over tau because this tells me how fast this term is going to basically disappear. So five time constants, so five times this, this term will essentially be very small or effectively zero. So taking my final answer there, just changing the 333 is take the reciprocal of that and get three milli. So let's pull out the two pi from here. So I've got my 5.76K dividing two pi out to get it 916. So this is the frequency in Hertz of this cosine that's a decaying exponential. This is true for T greater than or equal to zero because this is an inductor current. And it gives six points for this equation, no partial credit. Lastly, the current was given as zero for T less than zero that was worth five points. This is problem number six. Problem number seven is to prove the Wheatstone bridge condition. And that is if the current in this meter is zero, then the resistor R sub X is equal to R2 times R3 divided by R1. So we can actually make this an unknown resistor and use this as an ohmmeter. 
Okay, how are you going to prove this? Well, when the current is equal to zero here, the current in R1 is the same as the current in R3, and likewise R2 and R sub x have the same current. So I could use voltage divider. The voltage across R3 would be R3 over R1 plus R3 times V sub s, and the voltage across R sub x would be R sub x over R2 plus R sub x times V of s, because again, the current is the same in these two resistors. But because there is a short here effectively, there's also zero volts. That makes these two voltages equal to each other. And that was worth 20 points if you had that step. The V sub s is drop out. I could write this by dividing numerator and denominator by R3. So I get a one, a one in R1 over R3. Divide numerator and denominator by R sub x, I get a one, a one, and then R2 over R sub x. So these two equations look the same. So this quantity here would have to be the same as this quantity for this equation to be in balance. And so R1 over R3 must equal R2 over Rx. So you could cross multiply these two. So R1 Rx equals R2 R3. This is really the product of the cross arms and the bridge. And that's how I remember the formula. But this, of course, is the derivation. And the solving for R sub X, we then get R2 R3 over R1. This part of the completing of the algebra was worth nine points. And this is the final exam for ECE 201. Now that you've completed the final exam, let me show you how many people calculate a grade for your course. It's a technique that I use in actually assigning grades. Back on page one of this final, there was a curve based on the class that took this exam. And I've done this for each of the three hour exams too. Now if you take the highest A on an exam and assign it a five, the lowest A a four, lowest B a three, lowest C a two, lowest D a one, what you have is a number that's continuous between one and five, indicating the strength of your grade. Now if you didn't pass the exam, it's just a zero. Now suppose that you're a quarter of the way between 160 and 200. Well, then you have a 4.25. Suppose you're three quarters of the way between 130 and 159, well, you have a 3.75. Let me try to put this together into a final grade. Suppose on exam one, you did get a 3.75. In other words, this would be three quarters of the way between the three point and the four point grade. Maybe you didn't do so well in the second exam, it had a 3.33. Again, a third of the distance between the three point and the four point. Maybe on the third exam you did better and you're about a quarter of the way between four and five. Suppose that on the final you did really well and you were halfway between the four point and the five point. All right, so we had three one hour exams and we had one two hour exam, so that really had equivalent of five one hour exams. So take the first score plus the second score plus the third score and then your final twice and divide that by five. In this case, the student got a 4.066 and that would be an A. If you got 4.5 or higher, that would be an A plus. If you got 4.75, and higher, I would consider it to be an A++. Congratulations on your finishing ECE 201.